Um, thank you to Bill for taking the class two weeks ago and starting off with a good thumbnail sketch of the restoration history and movement. And as Bill can tell you, and any of you who have done any study in that area, uh, he just touched the hem of the garment. <laughs> uh, but it is important for us to have an overall view of where we came from. This lesson tonight begins our study grounded in the role of memory as it relates to our individual and communal history as churches of Christ. Uh, individually tonight, we bring a host of memories that are related to our understanding of church and what it's looked like over the years. Uh, probably some of our earliest memories uh, are in church with either our grandparents or our parents and others of that generation that handed to us particular understandings of scripture, church, culture, and what it meant to do the will of God faithfully. And over the years, some of those memories have faded. And they're not as crystal clear as they once were. And you know, it's interesting that both memory and history have a way of doing that. Now, in our collective communal history, we also bring a host of memories related to our understanding of church and what that's looked like over the years. We remember such things as tent meetings, old faithful gospel preachers, as we used to call them, preaching one and two week meetings at a time. And I know that you can remember specifically the names of some of those preachers. Sunday afternoon dinner on the grounds, followed by monthly area-wide singings. Many of you remember those. People flooding down to the front of the auditorium for prayers of restoration. That was a common thing. Or individuals being withdrawn from because of their lack of attendance on Sunday morning. Uh, unfortunately, there was that part of our history. And there are parts of our collective history that we've tried on purpose to forget because maybe some of those are not so pleasant. But truthfully, every religious group and movement has had its weaknesses. And churches of Christ are, of course, no different. Now, there's a particular phenomenon to the uh, uh, dimension related to memory that's especially pertinent to our study here. You see, not only does memory fade, but what we remember is sometimes inaccurate and incomplete. And the authors in our study book, Distant Voices, uh, make this case very strongly. And you're gonna see that as we go through every particular chapter. Now, I'm old enough to remember and to have watched several things go by the wayside in our fellowship. We used to have singing schools to train our song leaders. You may remember some of those. We used to have young men's training classes uh, so that potential scripture readers and public prayers, prayers and teachers could be trained and groomed. And many years ago, the typical minister, and I know Bill, Bill will remember this, just part of our work was once a week a morning ladies Bible class in many, many churches. Uh, that was part of the history. that The minister taught once a week in the morning a ladies Bible class. Now you also, yourself, you could probably recall a lot of practices, things that you've experienced over the years that just sort of kind of faded away. And only occasionally in conversation, either with your children or with other people that you know, when you bring those things to memory, it's amazing how all that comes flooding back. Uh, you can see faces of people, names of people, events that you had forgotten. It's just amazing how that happens. 
Now, not only are our memories inaccurate, faded, and incomplete, but there's another function of memory that our 22-week study is going to seek to address. That memory tends to make past practices sacred. Practices that only began as a convenience and a pragmatic approach to a particular issue or problem. Probably the best example that's happened in this auditorium about a year and a half ago. Uh, it was on Wednesday night, and we were going through the study by John Mark Hicks on, I think it's called Enter, Enter the Water, Come to the Table, something like that. It was a study of communion and baptism. And so after that lengthy study, the question was asked, after we had looked through baptism, several references to conversion and sort of a, uh, a biblical view of conversion, Somebody asked why I made no mention of the traditional five-step plan of salvation that's been so characteristic to our movement and really in its formulation has just about, for some people, believe that it's Scripture. Uh, and especially if you want someone to come to Christ, you have to use the five-step plan of salvation. Well, that question provided a wonderful opportunity for me to share the historical background of that. Uh, Walter Scott, beginning in the 1820s in the Western Reserve, a section in Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, was a very gift. In fact, he was called the Golden Oracle of the Western Reserve. Apparently, from what we know, had a wonderful gift for speaking and would draw crowds. Well, during the daytime, while he was teaching children, he would use his, his uh, fingers and his thumb and he would go through what he called the five-step plan. And, and I think he even called it the five-finger exercise. And during the day, he would teach the children that five-finger exercise. And he told the children, I want you to go home now and tell your parents that this guy who's taught you these five-finger exercise is going to preach tonight back at the school, and you have them come back. And it's interesting because that's how they got started. Now, as I grew up, I heard the five-step plan of salvation expressed this way. And probably yours was close to this. Hear, which meant hear the gospel. Number two, believe, which means you believe the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. Number three, you repent of your sins. Number four, you confess. And number five, you're baptized. So hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. Now, is that... That's what I heard. Is that what most of you heard? I was kind of assuming that's probably what you heard. Here's what's interesting. Walter Scott's original five were a little different. And it provides a perfect historical example how through time both memory and practice can change that a little bit. Scott's formulation was like this. Uh, he had... Uh, let's see the best way to describe it. His, his was faith... Repentance and baptism, those were very important to Scott. Number four, though, was remission of sins. And number five was gift of the Holy Spirit. And the reason he formulated it that way when asked about it, he wanted to make sure that he had in one hand both human response and God's participation. I thought, oh, I like that. That's pretty biblical, isn't it? human response, and God's participation. Whereas when you just have the five that we grew up with, the emphasis is on human response, and that's it. That's interesting. Not only that, but the five-step formulation that we're used to, the five-finger exercise, is never identified that way in Acts or any of Paul's letters or the rest of the New Testament. In fact, just in the first 11 chapters of Acts, recently in our small group, this was last year, we had a little bit of time where I shared with the group the diversity of phrases used in Acts, first 11 chapters about conversion. Listen to this list. It, and it's, I don't think it's 100% exhaustive, but it's pretty close. Repent and be baptized. They accepted his message. Repent, turn to God. You'll have your sins wiped out. Times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Turn from your wicked ways. 
Many who heard the message believed. Men and women believed in the Lord. The full message of this new life. Jesus might give repentance and forgiveness of sins. And as I was going through the list, making this list, that one stumped me. Because when we talk about repentance and forgiveness of sins, we only talk about it as a human response. This language lets you know that Jesus is also involved in it. Jesus might give repentance and forgiveness of sins. The priest became obedient to the faith. Kind of a neat phrase, obedient to the faith. They believed and were baptized. Simon, the great one, believed and was baptized. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Philip baptized the eunuch. Saul began to see again. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He got up and he was baptized. Many turned to the Lord. Many people believed in the Lord. They were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The Gentiles received the word of God. Many believed and turned to the Lord. That's amazing, rich vocabulary. And I wonder why we haven't captured the depth of that. That is beautiful. Uh, but it's easy to narrow things down and assume everybody knows what you're talking about. But I think this is a perfect example of what we're going to discover as we undertake this new study. Memory is not accurate, nor is it complete. And at the same time, it can be rigid and unyielding in its shaping of current events. So in our pursuit of trying to pull back the cobwebs of time and begin to be open to our discovering the past, let's never forget that where we are spiritually is precisely because we're standing on the shoulders of spiritual giants in the past. Men and women of faith who have followed the will of God according to their dictates of conscience. And I believe that our own journey today requires no less of us. So we can appreciate the past, build off of it, but we don't have to worship the past. I think it's a healthy view of the role of the past. Let me give you an example of where I think we have really failed somewhat in that um, when, and I, it was 1991. I had gone up to Rochester, Minnesota and was speaking to the church up there and a young man came up to me after church and he said, now, I have joined the Church of Christ. But he said, I have a problem. I said, well, Let's go back and forth. Let's talk about this problem. I thought it was going to be some big counseling problem. I go, okay, I'm ready for this. He said, I come from Greek Orthodox. He said, we have a real strong view of our history. And I've been talking to everyone in this church here. Nobody knows anything about their history. What is this? And that was, interestingly, about the time, and some of you may be aware of the work by, I think it's, Richard Allen, but it's called Discovering Our Roots. Um, so I gave him a copy of Discovering Our Roots. I said, please read this. And it will give you an idea historically where churches of Christ have come from. Uh, he, he, he liked it so well, he devoured it like in one night. So he got back with me. And after a few months, he sent me a message and said he decided that he needed to go back to the Greek Orthodox because the church that he wanted to be a part of had no appreciation of its history and nobody wanted to listen. I'm like, oh, that's sad. Uh, and it may be that people in that congregation didn't know how to talk about their past. And if you're not used to that, I'm sure it's a huge challenge. Um, and so as we, as we begin this study, we want to do so with what I hope is a healthy appreciation for our past. Uh, and it's going to mean that we're going to be doing a couple of things. We're going to find out that there's no such thing as a new issue, really, that the church has faced. All issues are kind of old issues. They've been around for at least 100 years or more. What will be fascinating is to watch how the church has responded to those issues and the different choices that they made. And we'll look at those. And I think you'll be fascinated uh, by how some of those issues uh, were addressed. And sometimes that lays a good foundation for us thinking about a way to deal with it now. There is a, there's a book entitled, Will the Cycle Be Broken? 
And I believe it's written by Richard Foster. And it's about a gentleman around the turn of the century. I say turn of the century. He died around 1908 or 1910. And he was so well known in both Churches of Christ and the Christian church that both groups claimed him as their own. And when Richard Foster wrote the book, he, he showed in 1908 that the issues that were surrounding both fellowships are still the same issues today. And what he, what he proposes is, and when we get to this time in our study, I want to lift up this gentleman. He proposes this gentleman represents a good model of dealing with controversial issues. And I think he's right, and I'll share that with you. <clears throat> One other story, and then we'll get into the lesson, if my voice will hold out tonight. Um, the family that I grew up in, the church that I went to on Sunday, um, didn't really have anything to do with knowing our history as churches of Christ. I remember as a teenager discovering on the top of our freezer in the hallway, way back where you're not supposed to see anything up there, my dad had, had obtained a copy of the book called uh, A Fool for God, and it's the book on Alexander Campbell. And so it was almost like he brought contraband into the house, and he didn't want us to know that it was up there. And as a teenager, I remember sneaking up there and taking that book down when he wasn't around, reading through. I was fascinated by the history of that. Didn't know that was any part of who we were. And I think that sort of began my interest in our own history. You may have sort of similar stories where all of a sudden your, your, your historical awareness was awakened. Uh, up until the time that I was uh, in college, I really didn't enjoy history per se. Because uh, I remember history just being dates and people, and that wasn't interesting to me. Uh, guess what changed me? When we were in college and I had to take a history course, I went, oh, man. Okay, I'll take one in American history. Our professor, the week of the Battle of Shiloh, piled us all in a bus, and we went down to Shiloh the week of the battle, and we got to walk on the battlefield. We got to see uh, the video that went with it. That was amazing. I mean, you not only would it uh, awaken my historical awareness, it lit a fire under me. So that both Civil War history and Restoration history has been a passion of mine for probably 25 years now. And a lot of what I want to share with you during this class comes out of that love and that passion for history. Now, I want you, I was trying to think to lay down some, some really good guidelines for this class. I want you to feel free to ask any question you want. There's no such thing as a bad question. Now, I may not know the answer to it, and that's okay. And I might have to say, okay, next week, I'll come back and I'll deal with that question. But I want you to feel free to ask questions. And when you don't understand where something came from, please ask, because we all may need to have to go on some kind of detective hunt to find out where such and such a thing got started. Uh, but we're, we're exploring this together uh, to give us a good history. Well, here's what we don't have. We don't have any of this material written for our teenagers and young people. Are you all aware of that? Nothing in our brotherhood on this for the younger generation. I need somebody to volunteer after this course. You, you do. <laughs> I want you to write that. We need to do that. We honestly do. Somebody needs to step forward and do that. Okay, I can keep on rambling. Let's, let's dive into chapter one. This is, this is good stuff. We're going to be talking about the role of memory. Now, when I flash each one of these slides up, what I've done is gone through the chapter, and I've tried to pick out significant statements and as we go along, I'll put them up and I'll make a comment or two. And please feel free, if you want to, if you want to chime in and have a, a comment based on what this uh, particular slide says, please feel free. Because uh, we want you to feel like you're actively participating in this. Now, I don't know. Yeah, you can see that pretty good. In every, and I think I can say this without contradiction, in every Disciples of Christ church building I've walked in for years, 
this picture had been on their wall in the foyer. A few Christian churches have it. I've never walked into a church of Christ where it's been up there. Now this picture, up at the top is Alexander Campbell, the bot, or uh, Thomas Campbell, down at the bottom is Alexander Campbell. If you can see it, I know it's a little fuzzy. Over to the left is Walter Scott, and over to the right is Barton W. Stone. You're going to hear a lot about these four guys. They're sort of called the pioneers of our movement. And each one had a significant contribution in the early 1800s once the restoration movement began. If you look in the literature, there's been a change in terminology, just so if you want to look up stuff, you might need to know this phrase. Um, everything used to be under restoration history, a restoration movement. Uh, there's been a change in terminology. It's now the Stone Campbell movement is what it's called. So there will be a lot of good material. If you just want to go on Google and look up stuff, just be aware that's a good search term now, the Stone Campbell movement. Okay. Memories comprise key episodes in our history. Memories comprise key episodes in our history. Boy, was that ever true when I saw that illustrated when it had, we had our 70th anniversary here. The stories that people told from their memory was amazing. And if you were here for that weekend, and that, that uh, particular celebration of the 70th anniversary, uh, you may have had an opportunity to share some of your stories where you've been here over the years. Uh, it was fascinating getting ready for that event to go through all the old bulletins. We have them in the archives uh, dating back to, oh man, what were the first ones? There's some in the late 50s. No, they go back earlier than that. There's, a, there's some in the early 50s. And I remember, and, we, and there's no way we could track this down, there was a minister who was here and the last week he was here, there was a little blurb in one of the bulletins that said that he had taken, uh, I don't know, like two 50-foot rolls of, uh, of, of course, it wasn't called videotape back then. What was it called? Uh, anyway, uh, he took the video cameras on the rolls of tape. What was that, 35 millimeter? What would it have been? It was the old-fashioned stuff, whatever it was. But he said he was taking it to Texas with him. And if anybody wanted copies of it, get a hold of him. And I thought, oh, can you imagine if we ever found uh, those rolls of, that, of, the media, you know, of those videos from way back then, what that would have looked like. So memories comprise key episodes in our history. And what's interesting, just in the time that all of us have been here at Highland View, you remember certain things that other people don't. And there may be certain events in certain years that were really important to you, and somebody else just doesn't remember it at all. Certain events get imprinted indelibly in our memories, while others get blotted out or remember only with difficulty. And, and that's so true about memory. And that's why it's so, and we'll come to this toward the end of the class. There's a couple of verses that I want to look at regarding memory. And you'll see the value of remembering things. Now, I want us to look at a, sort of a test of the previous statement. What do you remember of your grandparents as it relates to church? Um, somebody want to share a memory? What do you remember of your grandparents as it relates to church? And of course, this, this may call back some early memories that you haven't um, tapped into for a while. You were in a one-room building where you got stung by a wasp. <laughs> do you remember? Do you have any recollection of how old you were? Um, five or six. Probably five or six. So you can remember back. So it, it was a one-room building. You were with your grandparents, and you got stung by a wasp. Yeah, that that you can see why you would remember that one. About years. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay. Anybody else? So your grand oh. so so your grandmother always wore a hat on Sunday morning. How many grand how many of you had grandmothers that wore hats on Sunday? See, now 
probably there will be a place in this study where we'll at least want to tap into this to talk about why they were those and why it was real important. But some of you can remember those, can't you, that your grandmother wore hats on Sunday morning. Okay. <laughs> so the white shirt always seemed to be one size too oh, small. Yeah. Okay. And they, and I had always been new overalls back then. Oh, okay. Well, and I remember from my grandfather, uh, and I'm sure some of you remember this too, that he had two pairs of overalls. And he told me this once, and I don't remember how old I was, but it stuck out in my mind. One was for working, one was for Sunday. Okay, so some of you may remember that. Okay. Any other memories that stick out? Yeah, uh, Mickey? Probably five or six years old, and I would sit between my grandparents. My granddaddy would be on one side, my grandmother on the other, and he'd look over, and Mama was probably nodding off. And he'd <laughs> and he's... <laughs> no, I'd have to go through. <laughs> so at an early age, you were exposed to people nodding off, huh? Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay, anybody else? I, I remember my grandmother as I was growing up was never in the Bible class where I was, but she was always teaching a women's class on Sunday morning. Okay. Elderly women. Yeah. So, so you remember your grandmother in a teaching role. Yes. So every Sunday morning she was teaching a ladies class of elderly women. So that's a, that's a memory that goes way back to where from the earliest time you can remember, you've got somebody in the family that's in the teaching role. Yeah, very good. When I was younger, for a really long time, I'd cry when he was at the pulpit because he was a old school Baptist minister. <laughs> so he was real, real loud, real, real show, real, real hell brings home. But at home, he wasn't like that. So when I was little, oh. they wouldn't let me into the sanctuary because I could just holler. Oh, wow. I'm not so, so scared of him then. Uh, didn't like it. So you were scared of him, and he had the old fire brimstone kind yeah, of style. Fire brimstone style, real loud, but he wasn't that way yeah. normally. You know, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because think about probably what you and others would be wrestling with is, okay, now here, here he is functioning this way during the week, but he's like this on Sunday. So your young mind tries to figure out how do you bring those two together? Yeah. Yeah, it's awful scary. <laughs> oh, well, 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 let's go back to another point that's critical with this. How many times have people young in their life been so impressed with something that's, that's really not healthy as far as religion is concerned, but that deep impression goes with them the rest of their life, and you have a hard time overcoming that? Because you're young when you're impressed with that, and you think that's the way it is. And you probably did for years. Oh, yeah. yeah, so amazing. Okay, anybody? That's great. Thank you. Anybody else? Memories of your grandfather, grandmother, grandparents. Um, this, that's just one. Now, whenever you can think about getting together with, you know, and you've done this, family reunions, and listen, you may be talking about an event that happened at church, and just among your siblings, everybody's got the story different. Have you ever, <laughs> you ever had that experience? That's not the way that happened. That's the way I remember it. So everybody has a whole different perspective, even just among their siblings, about a past event in church. And this last one is sort of kind of like the first one, but what do you remember of your own childhood church? Uh, as I was thinking about that, what came to my mind as I was growing up, the church where I grew up was a, was a large uh, Gothic structure kind of church. Had uh, stained glass windows and it had a painting behind the baptistry. Well, when I uh, left home, I was shocked to find that other churches of Christ were not what I grew up with. Because um, I didn't really go visiting anywhere. I just expected that every 
church building ought to be Gothic structure. It ought to have stained glass windows. And by all means, it should have a painting up behind the baptistry. Well, I'm here to tell you that was not my experience once I got away from home. So what I grew up with was not normative, and it may be probably what you grew up with. Uh, but just to be aware of your own childhood memories and how that shapes and molds your view of church is really critical for us to think about. The author says our memories are highly selective and we try to make sense of things, making logical connections. And that's with all of us. Uh, and I have to be careful in making any kind of judgment on your memory of the past. Because when you remember something in the past, you're also trying to make sure that it makes sense in your world of, of ideas. I mean, we have to assume each one of us is as logical as we know how to be. <laughs> Even though you may say something, I might think, that's not very logical. Uh, but in your own mind, you know, we're assuming that everybody's trying to make logical connections with, with your memories. So in one sense, we kind of create our past. And by that we mean our remembered past powerfully influences our present life. It really, really does. Now here's the interesting thing, and you may not know this, uh, well, you do. Uh, think about in families, when you get together during holiday season, you realize at the moment you are creating memories. And you may say that. Well, we're, we're going to take a video here because we're creating memories. Well, yeah, we're creating memories. As God's people assembled together, as we live together as God's people, each week, each month, each year, we're creating collective memories as God's people. And that's, that, that's a very crucial dynamic of fellowship. Sometimes a long forgotten or unknown event when recalled or learned recasts parts of the story, helping us see the whole story in a new light. That's the reason we're having this whole study. Because I want to bring in events from the past. That, and, and, and when you read ahead, you're going to find out there are things in our history you probably didn't know about. But it's going to give you a greater appreciation for who we are as a religious movement. Uh, we've already talked about Walter Scott and the Five Finger Exercise. So seeing the past in a new light can bring clarifying perspective and healing balm. It can help one clear up imagined hurts and bring healing to unimagined, terribly real ones. It can provide the impetus toward reconciling old estrangements. And it can make the future look different. Boy, if, that, if, if that's what memories and trying to brush back the cobwebs of history can do, uh, we say all the more. Because that's a powerful statement on allowing the past to help you see the future and the present in a new light. Our memories of our Christian heritage are selective. And so this book that we're going to use is going to be an aid in helping us with the exercise of remembering. The author says this book has one overarching purpose, to recover some of the forgotten or distant voices from the modern history of churches of Christ. And distant voices, at least the way he's using it in the book, has a double meaning. First, those voices that come from a time now long past, so distant voices, but also minority voices in Churches of Christ that eventually got drowned out. That's a fascinating part of our history, too. Because on occasions, people would stand up and say, listen, we're going the wrong direction. Uh, no one would listen to them. Uh, they kind of got pushed over to the side. And you're gonna, we're going to see men and women who were very passionate about what they were saying, but no one would listen. And many times their voice got drowned out. Nobody wanted to listen. And within our short lifetime, we have experienced a fairly fixed, uniform tradition that we've assumed has the story of restoration movement from the beginning. But I want, I want you to think about this phrase. When we use the expression restoration movement, we have to recognize things move. <laughs> Practices change. People are not the same. Lots of things move. 
And we, we want to try and see if we can discover that kind of movement and appreciate how we got where we are today. Now, in the past, I want you to be aware of this. This is really crucial. And, and at times where it is necessary, I will bring up uh, names that relate to editors of journals. The early restoration movement went crazy over two things publication of journals, and establishment of colleges everywhere. And what was fascinating was, there, and it's almost a tension, and we'll have to look at this as we go along. And, and it's kind of strange. The pioneers of the movement were heirs of the blessing of additional higher education. The average person in the restoration movement was the good old pioneer out chopping the tree. How do you bring those two together? And as we look at the restoration movement, you're going to see there was some tension there. Um, and some people will make the, make the claim that since Alexander Campbell was independently wealthy, and we'll talk about him a little bit uh, in the future, he could pretty well say what he wanted to, and he wasn't accountable to anybody. <laughs> a little bit of truth to that. Campbell didn't care what anybody thought. Uh, on the other hand... There were individuals who recognized the need of community and being accountable to one another and that the gospel needed to be presented on a level that every person could understand it. So there was some real tension going on and we'll, we'll see where that comes up in, even in the study of our book. But the editors of journals, particular journals, uh, held quite strong sway through the restoration movement. Let me give you one. The guy's name was Arthur Crayfield. Probably, because I know in our restoration movement, the guy's name was Ben Franklin, not the Ben Franklin of American history, but another Ben Franklin. He was close friends with Arthur Crayfield. Arthur Crayfield decided that it fell upon his shoulders to begin publishing a magazine that was called The Heretic Detector. Okay? So every month he was going to have a list of both preachers and churches that had run into heresy and you weren't supposed to have anything to do with it. And it started to have some pretty strong influence. So finally, Ben Franklin said, uh, th this is not what we're about. He was able to get Arthur Crayfield over to the side and convince him finally, this is not what we're about. But there's something in our DNA that if we're not careful, we love to point out where other people are heretics. It's just been kind of, and we'll, and we'll see if we can discover where that got started uh, as we study in the book. But then also college presidents. And I will try to have a list. I'll compile a list of when certain colleges began, how long they ran. Uh, there is one. Uh, when what was the name of it? Burrett College. Any of you heard of Burrett College? Out by Smyrna. What's that? Yes, Daniel Burrett was the one that helped fund the beginning of it. And it lasted, it started in the 1880s. It lasted up until about 1955, somewhere along there. And it was supposed to be a liberal arts Christian college, mainly funded by area members of Churches of Christ. Uh, one of the past presidents of UT University, University of Tennessee, graduated from there. And there was some other interesting history. But over time, uh, that particular school folded. But every president of every Christian college was perceived as a leader in our fellowship. And often they could say things that sort of... Um, would dictate which way the wind was going to blow. And we're going to look at that. That's fascinating. And then, of course, preachers who were famous just by the fact that they were well-known, they traveled widely, and people knew them, and usually what they said was pretty well what people believed. And uh, we will look at some of those famous preachers as time went on. But when you begin to see that a fellowship like ours that does not have a central head office, conference office somewhere, 
uh, I've, I've talked with people who, only people who are in a fellowship that doesn't have that kind of central polity uh, understands how you can have uh, a religious movement exist without that. But when you don't have that, there are still spheres of influence. And in our fellowship, these three areas, individuals had tremendous sway on any of the issues we could bring up whether it was instrumental music, the missionary society, the role of women, the war question. I mean, I could just give you a whole list. And depending on which college you were at, um, depending on which paper you read, and depending on which preacher you liked, that sometimes would determine where you ended up on some of the issues. Yes? In, in addition to that, the publishing companies that were started around some of these, yes. what gave us our literature for our classes, Yes. Which yep. controlled the message. It did. Uh, we had some real strong... Let me tell you something about this. It's neat that you brought that out because that may be a whole lesson we'll have to look at. Did you know that the first publishing in the middle of 1800s was because they felt that the Word of God needed to be published and it needed to be printed and sent out because the year 1900 was perceived to be the ushering in of the new millennia. And some people actually thought that Christ was going to come back and set up a new kingdom. But before that could happen, the word needed to get out all over the world. And it's fascinating that the early preachers and pioneers of the Restoration Movement were really invested in getting the printed scriptures out wherever they could. So the original publishing houses uh, did a lot of printing of Bible and scripture. But then they moved into more of what you're talking about, Mark, that they began to publish particular types of literature that were often used within the Bible classes, and that was pretty standard because it almost became like, functioned like a catechism. Though it was never called that, it sort of functioned that way. <clears throat> In the chapter, he has this quote from Walter Brueggemann. The capacity to give authoritative interpretation within a tradition is a matter of social power and not primarily a matter of insight or, insensiti or sensitivity. And important insights may reside at the margins of a tradition as well as its center among the minority as well as the majority. And I think over, and I've seen this over the last probably decade or more, maybe two decades, there's been more of an attempt to go back and embrace the broader part of our whole movement. Because there were people at the margins saying things that were not what the typical Church of Christ member would say. And sometimes they got ran out of town, sometimes they didn't. But because of that, there's been an attempt to embrace the broader view of our fellowship. Churches of Christ are now in a time when the central or dominant voices of the 20th century tradition are being questioned, gently by some, more sharply by others. Uh, I put here as an example, the gentle questioning is perhaps a book like Tim Woodruff, The Church That Flies, if you've read through that, kind of his rethinking maybe what the church needs to be, to be a little bit more biblical uh, from his perspective. And then Leroy Garrett with his famous, What Must the Church of Christ Do to Be Saved? Uh, a scathing rebuke of our tradition. If you've not read it, you need to read it. Now, you don't have to agree with it, <laughs> okay? But you need to be aware it falls within the category of a scathing rebuke of our fellowship. And he believes that we are really, really off base and some things need to change. And some of the things that he says is right. Some things do need to change. Now, it is a time when many people are assessing their spiritual heritage, indeed a time when the traditional settlement of center and margin is coming under critical review. And you may, I think I mentioned Discovering Our Roots by Hughes and Allen. Listening to various voices of the past helps one glimpse a modern heritage that is broader and richer and more diverse than one presently may suppose. And then out of such listening can arise a new and perhaps more faithful settlement of center and margin. That's his, toward the end of his uh, chapter, and, and I, I rephrase it. A new and perhaps more faithful embracing and appreciation of center and margin, I don't think there's going to be any kind of settlement here. 
It's not about settlement because that leaves the impression I'm going to get you to see things like I do. Well, no, no, no. What we're looking at is a faithful embracing and an appreciation of our history where people have taken different views on different issues. And still, and here's been the critical thing. Where people demonstrated the mind of Christ and were able to work together with, with big differences, uh, I see a rich history coming out of that. Where individuals couldn't tolerate one another and fought with each other, denounced each other, and sort of made each other the heretic, uh, nothing good ever came out of that. And so I'm hoping that also with this study, we'll begin to appreciate how wide and how diverse our history is, uh, how you approach someone who has a different view than you do. I mean, there's a lot of great benefits from this kind of study. So this is kind of where we're headed. I thought it was such a neat way to start this book. I couldn't have thought of a better way to start this because it does start with memories, both individually and collectively in our history. Uh, our time's almost up. We got two minutes. Does anybody want to share something, say something? Um, are you excited about this as much as I am? Um, speak now, forever hold your peace. What's that? Oh, you. <laughs> I think I really like history. Like, I yeah. get a little character. Yeah. Away with it. Well, that's but what I happened. I started reading it that night that you guys gave it to me, and I didn't get to bed because I kept reading it. How many of you, when you got your copy, read it till got read it one sitting? Okay, Donnie did, and you did. Anybody else? When I got my copy, when it first came out, you you know, the first edition, I stayed up till I finished mine. I could not put it down, and my response was, "Where has all this stuff been all these years?" Yeah. So. I'm hoping that you will appreciate it too. Now, now, in each chapter, if you find some stuff that you would like to share that goes along with the theme each week, and you've done some independent study, uh, please let us know. Because this is sort of a mutual journey. And I can only share what I know, which I know is limited. Um, and you, you may have done a particular study in a particular area where you've got something really rich to share with us, by all means, please let us know because we want to hear from you. So, well, let's, have, let's end with prayer, and I hope this will be a good study. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight so thankful, really for the richness of our own religious heritage. Help us to take what is healthy and good and that honors you and carry, uh, carry that forward. Help us also to realize that as your people, uh, our tradition does stand on the shoulders of men and women who gave their life and made it their life's work to do your will and to carry forth the gospel. We realize, Lord, that actually history critiques us, makes us ask these kind of questions so that we can be sensitive to what we need to know, sensitive to how we can handle issues that faced generations long gone and do it in such a way that we portray the mind of Christ. And Lord, we're thankful that you brought us together here tonight for the beginning of this study. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here.